we have Dr. Frank Alvarez, who is going to be giving us an update. And I know there are many people watching at home and we appreciate that. There's no reason to come to City Hall right now if you can watch in the comfort of your own home. So thank you for those people that are watching at home. And with that, I'll turn it over. Well, um, thank you. I'm, I'm uh, Frank Alvarez, as you mentioned. I'm a regional health officer for the uh, Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. And thank you for the invitation and, and uh, the timeliness of having me here to update you a bit on, on our um, work at the County Public Health Department and the messaging that we're trying to get out to all residents of the Los Angeles County um, today. So just to give you a brief background, I mean, we, we've been on the ground um, for, you know, since this all began in, in Wuhan. Um, so we've been screening over uh, several thousand passengers from the get-go. Uh, that were coming out of that um, region that uh, so we were monitoring them we cleared through them just a little while ago so that was kind of the first wave in a sense that we got through um, the uh, and then we started noticing cases right so you started you know reading about it I mean you're tracking it um, probably know uh, probably all the updated uh, cases uh, that we have at this point as of Today, I'm not sure if you heard the press release. It's uh, sort of, you know, it's been um, a tough day, obviously, you know, for, for the world in a sense, in terms of a, you finally have the World Health Organization declaring a global pandemic, um, <clears throat> which um, is, is really important for the world to be on the alert now <clears throat> in every country in the world to start taking this seriously. Um, and, and start preparing for what they would do in, in the event of it having out, them having outbreaks in their own countries. Um, we, are, um, we are now at around 20, I think as of today, uh, about 27 um, cases, um, and, and that's including three in, from Long Beach um, County. Unfortunately, today as well in the press br briefing that you might have heard, um, we had our first fatality in the county, and that actually wasn't a, a resident. It was a, a visitor uh, through the county who had a lot of extensive travel in Korea. Um, and, um, and we're monitoring we, we, what we do best in public health with a lot of the diseases that we monitor all the time is we monitor cases, their contacts. Uh, we isolate the cases. Um, I'm actually leading one of the regional teams that um, is um, really busy these days, um, isolating cases, quarantining their, their contacts, their close household contacts while we, while we monitor them and observe them. So that, that's kind of core public health containment. Um, as, as we now realize, um, this, this disease has moved beyond that um, key you know, public health 101 intervention. Um, although we will continue to do exactly that on every case uh, we, we discover um, and confirm in every uh, close contact of them as well. Now, now as you might have heard, um, we're moving to a social mitigation strategy uh, of social distancing. Um, so, um, I mean, just alone, I was having dinner and, and watching ESPN, right, and, you know, March Madness now is going to be without fans, right, and so they're also canceling concerts and venues from coast to coast now, and I, I miss the, the Trump announcement, but it sounds like he's also banning in-flights from, from Europe, which tends to, which is kind of looking like, the, you know, I don't want to say the new China, but it, it's where the epicenter of the outbreaks are going on right now, is out um, in Italy and other uh, other the countries out there, um, not to mention what we're seeing on our own uh, shores here now in in United States, especially in some real hotbed areas like up in Washington. Um, so um, so that's um, currently what we're we're doing. I mean, we're we're also working with cities, uh, communities, uh, getting the word out about good uh, good planning and practices. So if we start looking. Um, I don't know if any of you have been involved in uh, the calls that we've had, but our director, Dr. Barbara Ferrer, and our health officer, Dr. Um, Muntu Davis, have been having routine calls like every week for the last month with all the various sectors of our community. So they've been having calls with uh, City of Commerce's uh, city, uh, cities, um, county officials, with, um, you know, they've been doing religious, you know, religious uh, calls with that sector. They've 
been doing, you know, we've been on the link uh, constantly with our hospital providers, our healthcare providers. I mean, um, so we, we've been updating uh, constantly every week, you know, the latest information, what the strategies would be, what are the resources that we're monitoring uh, in terms of hospital capacity and to be prepared, right? So, um, and so we're doing that constantly. I, I um, recommend um, you continue to stay involved on those calls, engaged on those calls, because those will constantly provide you the latest um, recommendation and update from our department and our director. Um, so that's um, you know a lot of work we, we've been doing recently. Uh, we did declare, as you're aware, a, um, a county state of emergency, a local a public health emergency last week. Um, I think the city of LA did the same thing. Um, so that, again, engages us with more mutual aid resources, um, eventually some reimbursement through the, you know, through the feds in terms of um, reimbursing a lot of the costs that we've got going on with a lot of the work that, that we continue to do. But um, obviously, I mean, we're, we're, at, we're certainly at a point where, um, you know, the public health department is not going to, you know, turn the tide on this thing like we do on a lot of other diseases we do. We, we're engaged with all the time. Um, so, you know, we, this, is, this is where we're now, I don't know if you heard the, uh, the president of the World Health Organization, but basically it's like we're all in now. I mean, we, we all have a part to play to, to really what they call flatten this, this outbreak curve. Um, so the way we could flatten the impact of a global pandemic um, is to start doing things like social, like mitigation, like looking at venues that, especially venues that might draw in more vulnerable populations. So we do know the most vulnerable population in terms of complication and mortality have been senior citizens. I mean, I think CDC is using like 65 as the cutoff for the most part. We, so we definitely know they're the most vulnerable um, with the highest mortality that we've seen. Um, we also know those individuals with immune compromised diseases or cardiopulmonary diseases are also more vulnerable for more complications uh, of this infection. Um, pregnant women, we've started to notice that also in pregnant women there's an increased likelihood of complications, pulmonary complications there as well. Um, so those groups in particular, it'd be a good time for them also not to, not to go out to crowded venues and, and the like um, because Certainly, as, as this starts spreading a little bit more, um, you know, again, those are vulnerable populations that we do not, uh, we want to prevent from getting infected. Um, wh where we're focusing uh, in the, the county of Los Angeles public health is, is definitely with those um, highest risk populations at the moment. So the experience we've, we, you know, all the tragedy that we're seeing up in, in Washington and Seattle, um, as you know, is all in these skilled nursing facilities or the long-term care facilities. So we're working um, now very closely on inspecting and working with them, educating them, um, the hundreds that we have throughout the county and these cities. So we currently have a task force doing that sort of work. We're also working with homeless shelters, another very vulnerable population that we're working with um, as well. So we're, we're engaged with them as well. I think the, the, the important thing, um, I mean, we've been here before. I don't know how many of you have been engaged back in 2008, but I was part, uh, I just joined the public health department back then in Los Angeles when we were doing the H1N1 pandemic. Uh, we, we did, um, that was a little different different because we did were able to get a vaccine. We started our vaccine uh, point of distribution sites and all that. Hopefully someday we will have a vaccine against coronavirus as well. But that's all the more reason that without a vaccine now, without a, a targeted therapy for this now, we really need to slow this thing down by you know, social mitigation strategies that you'll hear more and more about. And you're, and you're starting to see, as of today, quite honestly, coast to coast, a lot of folks taking this quite seriously. And it, and it really is a wake up call. I think the, um, the, the experience out of China um, they, it seems like they put the brakes on it. I mean, if you, if you look at the data now coming out of the Wuhan province, they haven't had a case, uh, an incidence case for the last several days. Um, they've actually flattened out any new cases. They've had a, a lot of recovery of cases. 
Um, and, and so, you know, for what that's worth, I mean, that's, that's you know, I'll take any good news <laughs> I could, you know, we could get at the moment, but that's actually good, some good news that we could get through this and we could do this together as, as a community. Um, but every, everybody needs to take responsibility here, right? So it's, you know, the parents, you know, um, you know modeling the way for their family, their kids, you know, employers, you know, making sure folks that are sick stay stay home um, and, and and not come to work and spread this disease further um, you know looking at venues that cities and counties and private sectors might have those folks kind kind of start looking at backing off of some of those um, and, and I think at this point we out of the 27 cases I mentioned there's only two um, but there's two's enough um, where we can't trace it to like travel we can't t trace it to a known exposure. Um, so that's an indication that we do obviously have some community acquired uh, spread now. I mean, we, we, you know, we've got a county of close to 11 million, but you know, two, and, and, if, if, um, and there's probably a background of cases. I mean, you guys have all heard about how long, unfortunately, it took for testing to get out to the community, but it's out there now. So uh, you know, there was certainly, um, the more you test, the more you're going to find out that we, we, you know, all along probably had community, some community spread already. So um, the more we test, we'll probably be, you know, it's no doubt we're going to be seeing more cases. Um, and, and again, all the more need to really take active uh, responsibility to start looking at ways that we can all start slowing this thing down. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's possible, uh, you know, it's just going to take a, a really concerted effort to step up and do it. Um, we're, we're fortunate in a way with the biology of coronavirus. Um, it doesn't, like I, I also was the director of the t tuberculosis control department here in Los Angeles County. And with tuberculosis or with measles, those, those diseases aerosolize. They stay in the air and, and they can affect many, many folks for many hours. If I had it and I left the room, if I coughed tuberculosis, it would stay here for a while uh, and infect many. Um, the, the thing about coronavirus, it's a little like flu where it's, it's a respiratory droplet. So it, it falls pretty much within three feet of somebody who's sneezing or coughing this. It doesn't aerosolize. You don't need, uh, when you have a patient, initially when this first came out, we were really concerned. We didn't know a lot of the biology of it. We put folks in negative pressure rooms um, and all that, but this this is a respiratory pathogen that again falls to pretty much falls to the ground within three feet. The the guidance is actually uh, six feet, you know, kind of give that kind of buffer room. But for the most part, it's respiratory droplets that that fall down to the surface, and and all the more reason to be. Uh, cognizant of you know making sure we use good cleaning disinfecting wipes on high touch areas so we're looking I mean part of the the explosion on those cruise ships I'm sure was a lot of high touch areas over and over and over unfortunately that might not have been you know really well cleaned so um, so that's you know definitely it's really important to to make sure we we clean disinfect around us um, High touch areas. We've been, we've been giving a lot of advice along those lines to uh, businesses and the like, um, and and then the other, yeah, like I mentioned, stay home if if you're you're sick, and hopefully um, we don't continue to pass this along. The the other thing is that it doesn't, it it has a what we call a lower reproductive value, where it, it one person could affect like two others, uh, versus something like measles, where one person could easily affect ten others. Um, so it. it it does multiply and it can't multiply quickly, but on the other hand, it gives us an opportunity that if you could stop, stop an individual, you could actually slow this thing down a, a little bit easier than some other infectious diseases that, again, have like a nine or 10 X reproductive factor. So um, again, we're, we're at a point now, um, today was a global pan pandemic announcement. Um, you'll be hearing more from our department as well. You know, every day our uh, Dr. Ferrer goes on radio stations now, and she's having these weekly meetings. Um, they're not necessarily giving directives at this point, but they they may soon. I mean, this is something that our health officer has that sort of legal um, responsibility and authority that at some point he may declare, okay, time to shut all these things down and what have you. Right now, it's just you know, it's highly recommended and encouraged 
that folks start looking into that and, and start planning. I mean, we had we did plan, pre pandemic preparedness planning. We're ask, asking cities to start looking at their continuity of operation plans, their pandemic planning. You know, so we you know we did a lot of that back in H1N1 about a decade ago. We're definitely updated a lot of that in our department, and we're encouraging businesses and, and government and and. Uh, to do the same uh, because we want to make sure that we can continue to operate our essential functions uh, you know if, we, if we're losing folks because they're at home sick um, so anyhow that's um, it's a bit of the update I mean kind of a obviously a historic day in terms of this particular uh, disease but uh, to some extent we we've, we've been there before and I, I think we could pull together and get through this thing I was wondering if you I was wondering if you could address a few specific things sure you know we're very concerned about our senior population and we do have a robust senior center and, and senior programming. And based on what we've read with the CDC guidelines and recommendations from LA Public Health, is it the recommendation that we close those activities? I, I think it's a, it's a good ideal to start looking at doing exactly that. Because so, we, we don't want to be reactive. We want to be ahead of the situation. So. Like we have our own internal dialogues, but since you know you're here, I just wanted to ask you some very like pointed questions. Right, I, okay. I think I think it's going to be a matter of time that you're going to hear maybe right. within a week that we'll be directing, you know, depending on on the spread and how quickly right. it's going to spread. But start you know planning for alternatives. I mean, we we're working with a number of centers that are starting to look on. It might be a little bit tougher with a population like mm -hmm. that, but to you know do Skype or online right. uh, sort of um, educational classes and, and what have you, other ways to keep them engaged and, and being. When you talk about social distancing, does that apply to school children too? Because right now it's really mixed. Some schools have shut down, and the larger school districts are remaining open. And there's a lot of questions about that. So if you could address that, would be helpful. Right. Um, so on. on before I get into the recommendation that the the other the good news with some of the coronavirus mm -hmm. and the epidemiology we've seen is that kids are in a sense spared. I mean, for some reason they're not getting really sick. They're not dying from this. Um, so fortunately, um, they they seem to be doing okay through all this. However, um, they they obviously could could get the infection very mild again most folks about 85 percent of folks have very very mild um, mm -hmm. symptoms and they could carry it right so they could carry it to others so it's a good ideal to start looking um, at um, particular protocols or, or, or at least as as and it's probably going to be a school district by school district case by case kind of basis i i believe uh, LAUSD is starting to look at um, and they, i guess they're finalizing their plans but they, they may say, okay, if one kid comes down with it, we'll, we're going to close school. Um, and so those, those plans are being finalized, and some of the recommendations around school closures are also being finalized. At this, at this point, we are not telling the school to, to shut down. I mean, that would be something that we would work independent, you know, case by case, district by district mm -hmm. for. But we would also encourage parents to start thinking on planning and being prepared that if the school did close, how you know how would I accommodate for this for you know what are other ways we could accommodate for education and, mm -hmm. and we're asking districts to start looking into that as well and then just my last question before my <clears throat> colleagues have questions in terms of social distancing when you talk about different size events I've heard in like San Francisco they said like events larger than a thousand need to be canceled is there a threshold that we should be looking at within our community they're still looking at what that criteria is. I mean, it's somewhat, quite honestly, arbitrary. I mean, is it 500? Is it 50? Um, certainly, you could, you know, depending on the, the nature of the room as well and what have you. So um, I, I think the rough guidance in, in, terms of, in terms of gatherings with, let's say, seniors, um, risk popula you know, vulnerable risk populations, I mean, we're kind of putting it at around 50. Okay. Um, for those, I, I think the larger venues, and there was a venue, um, there are venue call updates uh, as well. They're, they're looking at certainly the larger venues as well. I mean, if it's, you know, the, I, I think those are going to go first, obviously, like form, the concerts, the forum, right. staples, what have you, and then it's going to start coming down to more of the micro um, venues in, in local cities and, 
you know, if we get to a point, maybe libraries and what have you, um, but that's um, all being staged as, as, you know, as we talk here as well. And just so our residents know, we're trying to be proactive and kind of try to be one step ahead. So, you know, we, it seems like your warnings are going to be coming very shortly. So we really are trying to be prepared and do things in advance just so our residents and our community remains extra healthy. If there's anyone here who wants to speak on this item, please make sure you filled out a speaker card and handed it to Mari. And I'll turn it to my colleagues if anyone has any questions or comments. I don't think. David, did you? No. Oh, sure. Just a couple. First of all, thank you for being here and thank you for the information. I've likewise been on the calls, including the one today with okay. uh, the White House uh, and tomorrow morning with mm -hmm. the county. Um, they are extremely informative. A couple questions I have, and, and you really covered everything. One, in our city, seniors are 50 and over, so you know, <laughs> officially designated. Okay. So we have a larger population of seniors. But my understanding in at least the most recent briefings, there was discussions of 60 and over not being recommended to fly and 60 and over with issues uh, pre-existing pre or preconditions such as heart, uh, diabetes, and other uh, health immune, immune deficiencies uh, issues to stay away from large groups, whatever that large term is. Yeah, uh, and I, I would encourage that. I would second that. I think, um, again, it, we're seeing six, I think CDC said 65. Um, we're, we're, you know, along those same lines. But, but you know, if it's 60 or if you've got um, 55, if you've got any, certainly if you've got any health conditions on top of that, it's, it's you know, in a, right now we're in a period where you want to move towards an abundance of caution with what you do. Um, and so that is a recommendation not to, not to fly out to, um, I mean, we're seeing, if, you, if you've been watching that global map, it's pretty much lighting up everywhere these days. So um, it's probably best, you know, in your own personal health and safety, um, not to go flying abroad at this point, yeah. And then uh, to echo the sentiments our, our mayor has indicated, we are here tonight, we're gonna talk about such items as uh, vaping, we're gonna talking about cell service, we are a very proactive city, and so I know that's important to, to all of us. Um, in listening to you and listening to some of the things, the biggest concern appears to be not just that it's the worldwide pandemic, which we haven't seen in at least my lifetime that I'm aware of, uh, but uh, that designation, but that there is no inoculation, there's no cure, and there's no certainty as to what future potential long-term effects might occur from even someone fighting off the corona the covid-19 is that accurate that that's accurate that at the moment there there's no vaccine right. i mean although you've you've heard about how they're rushing to try to develop it but that sure. takes a while uh, through all the phases um, they they've got some promise with some anti retrovirals that they they've been using but again those are in early phases and and uh, we'll see how that go um, I, I think there, there's still a lot to be learned about like the long-term consequences of this it's still pretty early and um, so there is a, a lot of um, prospective and ongoing studies now with with coronavirus again we, we at least the biology of the virus we, we do know and in, in terms of how it, it infects folks and the distance and how it falls to the ground and it's not aerosolized and all those kind of characteristics that, that give us, in a sense, a fighting chance. I mean, if it, this was something that was much more aerosolized, it would be a lot tougher to, to deal with. Um, and especially if it, I mean, tuberculosis is, is pretty infectious, it's pretty aerosolized, but we don't have, I mean, we still have a significant amount of cases out there, but but you could, you could jump on an, an exposed individual and treat them. We've got some, obviously, treatment for tuberculosis. This, this we don't, and, and it moves quickly, as, we, as we're noticing. So um, again, you know, because it is a respiratory droplet, and, and now that we have testing available for the community, I mean, through um, both Quest Diagnostics, Unilabs now testing, if, you, if you've got any suspicion because of your symptoms and because of where you might have traveled recently, um, certainly, I mean, call your, call your physician, get checked out. They've got accessibility now to get testing done. Um, 
and, and you could get tested and, and find, found out and you get, you get a rapid turnaround. I think that was the other thing that we had such a delay on, unfortunately, in this country that we're now, you know, bit trying to catch up with, you know, with this in terms of who's, who's got it, you know. Right. I was just going to ask that again. The recommendation is not to just go to the emergency room or urgent care, but to call your physician and then have them direct you to a lab. And I think the final test go up to Sacramento for California. Is that right? Well, now they're going to private labs. Now you've got okay. Unilab and you've got Quest, Quest Diagnostics. Um, and we, we, we do help with some of the uninsured folks that so we're doing some of those labs in, in L.A. County still. Right. Um, Sacramento's doing labs, as you mentioned. The, 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 the key here as well, I mean, we're, in, we're still, our healthcare system is taxed right now with, with influenza. I mean, so we, we still have, we're still fighting that um, in terms of our resources, and now we've got this on top of it. So we, we you know, to, to not add to, um, you know, going, you know, if, you've, if you, you're sick and, you know, it's best to call your doc, call the office, call the emergency room if you think you're going in that direction, give them a heads up so they could, you know, advise you what to do um, so you just don't go in and, inf and infect others if you've got it. Uh, we really have to be, um, yeah, we really have to protect our healthcare system as well. And that actually leads me to another thing in terms of masks. Right now, as you all know, we've got, you know, this nationwide mask shortage. Um, those that are most at risk of getting it are our healthcare workers, right? So uh, we really need to protect <laughs> Our mask for those most vulnerable to actually get it—the folks that are on the front line fighting and treating these patients—and um, and and we we know that masks just throwing it on your face isn't going to do a lot of good. Viruses tend to come in around those, um, and, and in fact, um, there's studies that show that folks that wear masks um, touch their face a lot. You know, and 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 that's the other thing. I mean, if you're if you're touching things and you touch your mouth, nose, eyes, it's a great way to transmit the disease. You know. In, you know and, and catch it so um so we recommend that you know i mean actually mask if you're you're sick they actually work better because you're covering your your cough uh your expectorant in a sense but um we're trying to reserve those for our healthcare workers and and those that are taking care of you know sick folks with uh with other infectious diseases as well thank you very much i have nothing well, further now mary sue Yes, thank you very much for the work you do. Um, I was so relieved to hear that the county had targeted long-term um, senior facilities and getting ahead of that. I, I really appreciate that because um, it's just been tragic what we've been hearing. But our population, our senior population is a little different. We don't have long-term care facilities. They're, they're remaining in home. So I appreciated your suggestion that we think ahead of programming, maybe CTV or some kind of interactive um, games or contests or things like that. So I take that to heart too. Is there anything else you can think of that we can do in the next couple months to just keep people safe at home and and not uh, have a hard time, our seniors in particular? Yeah, I mean, along those lines, uh, it's important It's important to stay healthy, you know, through all this. And I know the, the kind of the anxiety and the mental anguish is a, is a big part of this as well, mm -hmm. and it really drains you. I mean, it drains you uh, emotionally, psychologically, and, in, and in your immune system as well when you're worried all the time. So part of it is, is um, to just keep, you know, keep active, you know, if, if you're, you know, if you enjoy doing certain things, you may not be able to do in, in, in groups with all your buddies and friends, but, you know, just, you know, go out and walk. I mean, you know, continue to exercise, continue to keep your, your, your health at, at optimal, you know, with eating and nutrition. And don't forget all the vaccines that are out there that are really good to help uh, protect you from getting the flu or, or pneumonia or what have you. Because, again, the more we use the vaccines that we have at hand, the less we're going to have folks going to the hospital and, and again, utilizing precious resources that we need for other diseases and uh, potentially As a follow for this up, um, for the next level of whatever that looks like, um, let's say Italy and, uh, and the entire uh, country is quarantined, does that mean people have to stay in their homes? Or like you say, can you call your buddy and say, hey, let's go for a walk and let's get out? Or is it homebound? What could we be seeing? Well, you, you, you know, you could still, I mean, the thing is, is that um, in, if you go out in, in, you know, fresh air and it's, you know, knowing that um, you're not going to be, you know, you don't want to directly be within somebody's space, I guess we're going to be redefining some of these things in our society for a while until we get through this thing. But again, 
not refraining from shaking hands, re, you know, in a sense, finding other ways to greet, but you're still at your, you know, your safe distance in a sense. And if, especially if you're outdoors, you, you know, you should be fine. Thing is, is again, to avoid going into settings where you're going to be in contact um, with with other folks that you know may may spread this in a close distance or touching things that have had high touch to them because um, if it's fresh and somebody's been touching something that might have been infected, you could pick that up as well. So again, it's to be you know not not to have this anxiety but to just be well informed to be alert um and wherever you go um just you know be uh, aware of those things and uh certainly enjoy i mean you guys have a you know obviously a very beautiful uh city uh you guys are especially proactive i mean in, in my region and if i look at health statistics i mean you guys you know lead the way so you know kudos to you guys in terms of being so proactive in, in many of the the things you do here in the city and did i hear you say that a new vulnerable group that is being recognized as women? Preg pregnant women. Pregnant women, yeah. okay. That's yeah, so that's a, that's another thing we're, we're, we're um, notifying, yeah, because we're, we're seeing that they're having a little bit more complication okay. with pneumonias and things like that because their lung capacity issue there as okay. you know, they go along is a little bit less, right? And then my last question is actually for the city manager. Um, you stress the importance of having, having a continuity of operations for businesses, for local government. I imagine we have been working on that. I don't know uh, specifically what it is that, <laughs> that you're asking. Well, a continuity um, of operations. If staff starts falling out, cross-training, staggering the workday. Uh, the staggering of the workday certainly is a consideration, um, and we're working that, uh, looking at uh, um, uh, current programs that we have in place, whether or not we're going to cancel them, how it is that we're going to react to that and still stay functional as a city uh, are things that we're looking at. This certainly is impacting local businesses. Um, the hotel right next door, for example, has a, has a vacancy rate higher than it's had in many, many years. Uh, and so uh, we're working as this thing comes along. Before you guys let him go, I have about three questions. And before you go, there's three questions. Um, members of the audience who have questions, oh, sure. so I would just ask for you to hold on or would like to speak. So, Gary. Yeah, good. So I'll ask all three now, and oh, they're, okay. they're not really big ones, um, so just take them in. And I think that you already talked about it, but why do you suppose that the Wuhan new cases flattened out? All right. Number two, uh, we talked a little bit, or you did, about vaccines, but when do you think they will become available? And then lastly, how long does the virus live on exposed surfaces? So the the Wuhan, yeah, the Wuhan and what went on in, in the Hubei province um, is, um, to some extent, the experience there, I, I don't want to say is the most extreme that you'll see, but it's pretty close to it. I mean, it was martial law. They did extreme uh, quarantines, curfew, isolation, seg you know, social distancing. Um, so a lot of that um, over some time, I mean, obviously there was a lot of fatality in a lot of cases, but over time it, it turned the tide. Um, you, you didn't get this reproducibility of one to two. It started going one to one and eventually one just smoldered out. If you're just one case without passing along to one or two others, you're, you're going to start seeing a slow decline of new cases, which they did over time. Um, we and and so um, so it seems like with time, this virus um, does what now whether it's in the background there that's that you know we have so much more to study on this you know whether there's you know a lot of asymptomatic folks and carriers with this and and whether um, it doesn't seem to be infecting you folks maybe it's gone to a level that's so low which sounds like that it's not reproducing and, and going on and infecting more and more. I mean, they've got a population, what, 11 million plus in, in that province. Um, but you, you would imagine if, if that wasn't working, you know, I mean, they've got plenty of more folks that it could have infected and it could have just gone on and on. <clears throat> so that's, you know, in a sense, it's, you know, encouraging on that end. Uh, we, we don't know yet whether it's going to be something like the flu in terms of seasonality. We don't know if it's going to be with us like year in, year out. We don't know if there's going to be a cold flu and coronavirus type of season every year. Um, we, we, you know, lots let 
left to learn. It's so new. I mean, it's only been three months. Uh, we know that with MERS and with SARS, which were both coronavirus types, um, both of those, thank God this doesn't have that mortality rate. Both of those were very, very serious. The mortality rate was up plus, you know, 10 to 15 percent on some of those. Um, and, and those, like SARS, eventually faded away um, over time. Um, and, and MERS isn't very effective in, um, in spreading. And so fortunately, that one is, is really um, quiescent at the moment. Um, in, in terms of um, the, um, what was the second question? Uh, vaccine and when you think Vaccine, that would... yeah, that, that's a tough one. I mean, I know a lot of companies are engaged in it. There's like phase trials where you've got to try it out and animal models and, and safety studies, and that usually takes about six months, somewhere in there. Um, and if you're successful, then you've got other studies that'll take about another three to six months. So I, I, think, uh, I think it's Anthony Fauci, who's the director of NIH, was saying that, you know, at best, maybe about a year from now. So if it is seasonal, you know, if it's seasonal, mm -hmm. you know, and hopefully, hopefully at least it is, hopefully by the summer this thing dies out for a while, gives us a chance to take a breath, reestablish ourselves, get this vaccine going, and, and um, we'll start immunizing everybody kind of thing. But um, that's kind of a best case, you know, hopefully we'll see that uh, vaccine. In terms of um, how um, viable it is on the surface, um, that's still being studied as well. And we do know coronaviruses aren't like the most hardy viruses, um, actually, uh, which, which is good because that means with any, you know, common household, um, detergent kind of product you could get, uh, whether it's alcohol-based or a little bleach-based. Usually, you know, it'll say on, on the label itself that it kills coronavirus or viruses. Um, you know, wiping surfaces down will kill this thing. In terms of how long it stays on a particular surface, it could, it could be, you know, hours. There's some studies, 10 hours, you know, as short as a couple hours to a day or so. Um, but it, it does decrease its... Uh, infectious potential, let's put it that way. So its potency does fall with time and it doesn't seem to be very efficient. Uh, it's not a very efficient way of transmitting over, um, unless it's a fairly recent like infected surface. So, um, so again, it gives us an opportunity to, to wipe surfaces down and clean them up. Um, and, and we, you know, we really, to some extent, I mean, this is like kind of my self box is that we've gotten so complacent with flu, right? So we, 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 you know, we don't even think twice, and yet we've got 30,000 folks dying from flu every year, you know, f half a million folks hospitalized, and yet our, we've laxed our, our practices of good hygiene, which could interrupt the flu transmission as well. So, you know, you know here's an opportunity to really, you know, nail and practice all these good things that we should be doing anyhow, and, and start incorporating these as, as, as just the way we need to, to start living to be, you know, less disease free in terms of transmitting to others. So again, we've been working with businesses and, and restaurants and saying, hey, you know, just reinforce the stuff that, you know, in a sense we should be doing, you know, wiping all those places down, you know, start looking, we, we've been working with museums, you know, they're looking at high touch surfaces, mm -hmm. getting those wiped down. I mean. I mean, we kind of all knew in the back of our mind, in a sense, these, these are potential to transmit germs. But now it's like, yeah, we got to do this all together. We all have to take a serious part of looking at where we could, you know, clean things up, you know, doorknobs and stuff like that as folks circulate through high touch areas. Um, so I, I think maybe this, um, you know, as, as we kind of calm down, take a breath, kind of do this social distancing, hopefully we'll, we'll find these new patterns in which we will all be the better off for it in the long run. Yeah, yeah very good suggestions. And washing your hands uh, longer and uh, more often. There you go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if there's too many questions. Yeah. <clears throat> First of all, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate uh, all the good work and and very wonderful descriptions and and uh, tonight. I appreciate it. Um, you know, we don't have a health department. You are your you are our health department. Exactly. Um, right. And uh, and we're very appreciative of that. I just ask you to take back one thing, and that is, at this point, the more specific the direction that we can have, the better. And I know that the, the science is not there. The science doesn't say 50 people is okay and 51 is not okay in a room. I get that. But at this point, what we need are specifics. 
you know, should we cancel these activities? Should we cancel them for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks? These are the exact questions that we're going to end up answering on our own without the guidance of our, of our public health department if we don't get that information shortly. And I know this is, it's all, it's come very quickly and today's the day. And I imagine, I'm hoping tomorrow's the day we get the memo that says you really should close your senior center or you really should not have activities of this type for the next two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, whatever, whatever it is. And I think it's important for us because I want to make a decision based on your uh, advice, not based on, uh, my colleagues are wonderful, but none of them are public health uh, uh, experts um, uh, that I know of. And it's a it, it, what? It's a secret job. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'd love to get, we'd love to get uh, that information. And also, we're, we're a little Calabasas in the big county. So it's going to be better if we all do these things. Okay. Uh, you know, our residents they go beyond the borders of Calabasas on a given day. So it, if all the other cities and towns in the county are doing, you know, have those same rules in place, then we're all going to be better off. And so uh, I know you're working on it, but um, we're literally making these decisions this week. And to the extent we can have that specific guidance, that would be very helpful. Yeah, I, I, and, I, and I can't agree with you more. I'm just not at the no, position in a sense. Yeah, so tomorrow's call. I mean, right now we're saying consider to everybody, consider, consider, right. consider. We've got now two cases of community acquired disease. We know it's in the background to some extent, how widespread it is, you know, it may get there soon. I think at tomorrow's call, there, and our director and health officer appreciate that. They, they, they also want, in our board of supervisors, they want uniformity across the county. In fact, the, the draft plan that they're, they're working on for all of you, um, they're sharing with you know our neighboring counties they're sharing with the state as recommendations up and down the state so um so you know again like we're you know this disease, might, this disease knows no no boundaries you right so um we, but without any undue respect that might be that might take too long you know we have populations that we know that everyone is saying are high risk so to wait until like a document is you know, no, sun. no, right. So I agree. It's gonna, it's gonna come fast. I, I guarantee right. you. You may get something tomorrow. Not right. only on the call, but in, in yeah. like a, a, yeah, directive on in writing. Um, right now, it's, it's. I know the language from our director has been strongly consider this, strongly consider right. this. But I feel like that could also be enough for local cities. You know, like we've heard it like all over, you know, right. seniors are the most susceptible to this. So it's like, my question is why wait? Yeah. Like, why wait until, exactly. why wait when we already know? So I feel like what you, the information you've provided tonight has been great, and I know how busy you are. So yeah, I, I would encourage yeah. you to move ahead. In terms of magic right. that's numbers. That's what I'm saying. I don't want to wait until. Right, no, I, yeah. I, I, I'd encourage you. But in terms of those, like, black, you know, more black and white guidance numbers from our health officer and our director, those will probably forthcoming, I would assume, tomorrow or very, very, very soon. Good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Sure.